Well, welcome to our class number seven. We are going through at a snail's pace our seminar on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs and chasing every rabbit. And feel free to interrupt, ask any questions, okay, if you don't understand. In Psalm 19, amazing passage, but we don't have to cover all that tonight. It says, the heavens, notice heaven is plural, heavens, we'll get into more of that later. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. It's interesting, the Bible claims that the, the very creation shouts out the glories of the Creator. The evolution theory has the sun and stars evolving before the earth. God said real clearly He made the earth before the sun and stars. People say, how did they have light before the sun? Well, the first 13 verses of the Bible, there is light, but there is no sun. God is the light thereof. The very last 26 verses of the Bible, there is light, but there is no sun. So God doesn't need the sun. Probably God did it that way. I don't know why. But he can do what He wants. But uh, probably because many cultures worship the sun, and God in His wisdom knew, you know, they're going to worship this thing, and I want them to know I'm in charge, not the sun in charge. You've got to have the sun. You've got to have air. You've got to have water, but you don't have to worship it, okay? If you study the evolution theory compared to the Bible, absolutely every single thing is backwards. Everything is backwards. The Bible has the earth before the sun. Evolution has the sun before the earth. Opposite. The Bible has oceans made before the land. Remember the Bible says God created the earth and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters? Evolution has land before oceans. They say it was a hot molten mass and it had to cool off for billions of years or hundreds of millions of years before it cooled enough for you know, water vapor to condense. Exact opposite. The Bible says He made light before the sun. Evolution says the sun came before the light. The Bible says land plants uh, were created first. Uh, and evolution says marine life came first. Life developed in the oceans before any land plants. The Bible says fruit trees came before the fish were created. And evolution says no, fish came before fruit trees. If you look at any geologic column in any textbook, you'll see this is exactly correct. Evolution theory is backwards on everything. The Bible says He made fish before insects. Evolution says He made inse insects evolve before fish. Here's a geologic column. Insects came after fish. I got this one backwards, don't I? I got to go back and change that. Okay. Evolution has fish evolving, what, 200 and 200, 300 million years ago and insects coming 150 million years ago. I think I need to change that one. The, according to Genesis, uh, the creeping things were created before the fish. Look at Genesis chapter 5. Let me put a question on that. And uh, I may have to modify 0.6. I think I have got them reversed here in the wrong one. Because evolution has uh, insects after, fish before insects. Evolution says. Genesis. I'll go back and look at that one. Uh, let's finish the rest of these here. The Bible has plants before the sun. Plants on day three, sun on day four. Evolution has the sun created, you know, billions of years before the earth even came around. So it has it's backwards on the order of creation. The Bible has marine mammals coming before land mammals. Things in the water made first on day five. Marine or land mammals made on day six. Evolution has land mammals first, and then they evolve back into the ocean. Think about that. Evolutionist says, oh yeah, some fish came up out of the water, evolved legs, walked on land, turned around, went back into the water, and became a whale. Evolved onto land and then evolved back. The Bible has birds before reptiles. Evolution has reptiles before birds. Again, go back and look at the geologic column that the ones they publish in the textbooks. You'll see that's exactly what they do teach. It is backwards to the Bible. The Bible says the atmosphere was between two layers of water, and evolution says the atmosphere is above the water. The Bible says, these are the two most important ones, these last two. If you don't get anything else, get these. The Bible says man brought death into the world. What does evolution say? Death brought man into the world. How did we get here? Oh, billions of things died before they slowly evolved into man. This is probably the most critical and most dangerous difference between the two religions. Creation and evolution are both religious worldviews. But the death brought man into the world. Charles Darwin in his book said, I'm bewildered. He wrote to a friend. He said, I had no intention to write atheistically. 
but there seems to be so much misery in the world. He said, you know, from the war of famine and death, the most exalted object we're capable of conceiving, the production of higher animals follows. Darwin thought death was the process that drove the whole thing to work. Now think about it. If one animal evolves a little better than the rest, <clears throat> what must happen to the rest of them in order for this to work? They all got to die. I mean, if you got one cow that evolves just a little bit better, whatever, now the rest of them have to die or else the new improved cow model is blended back into the population. It's lost. So you have to get the inferiors to die. This is exactly what Adolf Hitler thought. And he thought he was going to speed up the process by finding out who the inferiors are and eliminating them. Let's just speed this up a little bit. And of course, history tells us what happened. The Bible says God created man. What does evolution say? Man created God. Isn't that what the evolution theory would teach? There is no God. Man created him. We need a God. And they have their whole theory of how God evolved from, you know, worshiping rocks and stumps and trees to finally, you know, uh, monotheism. And, you know, they got it all backwards, exactly backwards. The t people say, you know, couldn't God use evolution to create? These two theories could not be more different. I don't see any way they could be more different. They are just exactly the opposite. Could God use evolution to create? Well, the God that would need to use evolution is cruel, wasteful, and retarded. It is certainly not the God of the Bible. Think about evolution process. The God that would have to use that is cruel. Isn't it cruel to have animals that are, you know, partially developed and inferior and going to struggle and die? The whole evolution process of struggle and death is, is contrary to the Christian God. Exactly the opposite. The God that would use evolution is wasteful. How many bazillions of animals had to die in order to get this thing to work, you know? I mean, it's just a wasteful process. And it's retarded. There's no direction to it. Just things kind of, you know, meander on the way they want to go. and there's, there's no goal. There's no goal in mind. They're just, you know, let it evolve. That is certainly not the God of the Bible. And we'll cover much more on that on video 7 in about six years when we get there on uh, the uh, theistic evolution. Those people who try to say God used evolution are, first place, it's not what the Bible says, okay? There's no evidence for evolution anyway. So why compromise a good book with a dumb theory? I don't understand why they want to do that, okay? No evidence for it. And it is not the God of the Bible. So when I get into a discussion and people say, well, I believe God used evolution, I say, well, look, you're welcome to believe that. However, you need to understand, you're not talking about the God of the Bible. You might be talking about God like Osama bin Laden talks about God, but that's not the God of the Bible. He's got a different God than I do, okay? The Mormons have a different God than I do. Just because somebody says the words God does not mean they're talking about the same person that uh, is the God of the Bible. So, no, God did not use evolution to create. There's no evidence for evolution anyway. Okay, cover much more on that on video number 7. Psalm chapter 8. Yeah, I love this psalm. The whole psalm is amazing. Uh, David said, When I consider thy heavens. Now keep in mind, David spent his early life doing what? What was David as a kid? Shepherd. Shepherd. You get a lot of time to lay out there and consider the heavens. I mean, lots of time. You figure... You go to bed, you know, you go to sleep probably, you know, 10 o'clock or so, 11 o'clock or whatever. And, well, it gets dark way before that. So you get all the sheep in the pasture, you lay down to block the gate, you know, so the wolf doesn't come in and the sheep don't go out. And now you've got four or five hours to sit there and practice your harp or whatever you're going to do. Or you can't read a book unless you've got a candle. And you consider the heavens. If anybody knew how to consider the heavens, it'd be David. We don't, we, this is something we have lost in our culture. We are so busy being entertained by all of our electronic gizmos, you know, radio, TV, computers, etc. We have lost this taking time to consider the heavens. I remember as a kid, it was so fun just to go lay in the yard and watch the clouds float by. Or go out at night and just watch the stars. We camped out in the mountains once in uh, Colorado. My uncle Kurt took us all up there. and We got the tents out there in the middle of the mountains, no place Colorado. And real high elevation, and I woke up at 3 in the morning for whatever reason and we just went out and laid on the picnic table at the campground. Here we are, 50 miles from any city. Has you ever been in a situation like that where it's just stars like you can't believe how many stars there are? 
we saw a uh, hundred shooting stars per hour about you know two no I'm sorry it was 300 shooting stars we saw in one hour uh, laying out there my brother and I it was just incredible all over the place I don't know if it was I was probably 12 at the time so I don't remember what month it was there are two times a year when the earth goes through a band of broken up fragments where you get meteor showers you know it's uh, September and August and September I believe or twice we go through this band so it might have been then I don't know we saw a bunch of them that night but he said when I consider thy heavens we don't take time to stop and think we're too busy being entertained this is why kids are not developing the depth of character and understanding that that they should and that they used to in the olden days Psalm 39 the psalmist said while I was musing the fire burned the word muse means to think when you stop and think he said while I was musing while I was thinking the fire burned and some people they get this burning in their heart like man I just want to do something for God because if you take time to meditate think just take the time shut off the TV shut off the distractions get away from everybody and go think the Jews as they march up to Jerusalem once a year or twice a year the, the all the males of the city would be marching together up there to the city and they would sing the Psalms and there's a word they would say in there anybody know what that word is which means stop and think Selah stop and think they'd be walking along the whole village you know 40 50 80 100 200 people walking up the you know toward Jerusalem and you have to go up to get to Jerusalem no matter which is where you come from because it's up on a hill you know it's always going up to Jerusalem they would say great is the Lord and greatly to be praised Selah and they would all stop and think about it that's what it means stop and think great is the Lord stop and think we just don't do that I encourage people to just stop and think sometimes I'll be praying and I'll say Heavenly Father and just stop right there don't say another word and stop and think about who you are talking to Do you have any clue who this is <laughs> we're talking about the God of the universe you know <laughs> and we expect him to come like a puppy dog when we call you know hey God I'm ready to pray get over here listen to me right now get over here right stand right here I'm praying okay <laughs> like like we're the boss you know <laughs> while I was musing the fire burned you want to get your heart on fire for God muse quit being entertained and muse think Psalm 143 is the only other place the word muse is used in the Bible twice in the Bible the word muse appears I remember the days of old I meditate on all thy works I muse on the work of thy hands this is an example of the Hebrew parallelism where they would say the same thing twice for emphasis you know we do the same in English we say wow did you see that guy he was huge he was big we use different words okay we don't say he was huge he was huge we say he was huge he was big we would use a different word for emphasis to show wow that car was fast it was incredible it was you know uh, like lightning you know we use a different way of saying the really the same thing for emphasis the Hebrews did that continually all through the Bible Hebrew parallelism where they use say the same thing twice for emphasis he's talking about I meditate on thy works I muse on the work of thy hands muse and meditate would be very similar things here stop and think we just don't take time to meditate there was a king died many me so the story goes I don't know if it's true or not it's a good story I'll tell it all I know is it's a good story whether it's true or not I don't know <laughs> this king died his son was in his late teens and he was going to become the king and uh, as the uh, son went into the queen his mother and said my mom uh, I'm the new queen and the custom is you know for the queen to give me you know advice what would you like me to do I'm, I'm gonna be the king now and she said well son I just have one request he said oh this is gonna be great she said I want you to spend 30 minutes a day first thing in the morning thinking don't have any distractions no music no friends just 30 minutes sit and think he said well that'll be easy oh great and he's going off and first day you know he's thinking about the big party he's planning that night I'm the king now you know I'm gonna have all my friends come in we're gonna have a big party and second day you know he's thinking about whatever parties and you know what what to build next for his kingdom and but after a few weeks it just really got to him the taking the time to stop and think ate at him and he realized man 
this wicked lifestyle I'm leading is going to lead to nowhere. It's going to lead to destruction. And Satan is good at keeping people so busy that they don't take time to stop and think. Instead, they just rush off from one thing to another. I don't listen to music as I drive. I, I like music. I love music. But I, don't, I, don't, I very rarely listen to any music. That's my thinking time. Just think. You get all kinds of ideas. You know, you ladies that pick up the phones, I call in the middle of the night, leave a message on your phone. You know, hey, write this down. I got this great idea. I did not realize until just a few months ago that when I was calling, leaving these messages, the message had the time on there. You know, this message recorded at 3.12 a.m. 3.12 a.m. Well, that's when I get my best ideas. You know, you eat a lot of pizza with peanut butter on it just before you go to bed, and you wake up with really wild ideas at 2 in the morning. Like, oh, wow, I never thought of that before, you know. Better than LSD. Oh, wow. Pizza and peanut butter, that'll do it. But this whole, this whole mentality, this whole practice, I guess, of just thinking. We let everybody else do our thinking for us. And if you watch TV, they're doing the thinking for you. They're telling you what to think. They're telling you how to look at things. They're telling you what to believe. If you listen to music, the music is a great tool or a dangerous weapon. Music can be used to change your whole thinking process. The communists have known that for years. They use music to train people to be submissive, to not rebel against communism. Music is a powerful tool, dangerous weapon, or a wonderful gift from God. That's why the Bible says, Speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. The Beatles had a song that was famous years ago. As they're singing the song, you got this beautiful melody, you know, they were good musicians. But in the background, somebody's chanting through the, whole, through the whole song, smoke, pot, smoke, pot, smoke, pot. It's just very subtle in the background, smoke, pot, smoke, pot, through the whole thing. Well, that gets into you, okay? The rock music and stuff these days is dangerous. And I would challenge kids, uh, if you want to develop a whole different personality, stop and think. Spend 20, 30 minutes a day musing, think. Don't let somebody else do your thinking for you. Read the Bible, read a couple chapters, and then just stop and think. It'll absolutely revolutionize your whole life, make you a brand new person. A theist is a person who believes in God. If you put the letter A in front of a word in English, it very often means the opposite. Okay? So an atheist is a person who does not believe in God, or at least claims he does not believe in God. I doubt there's any real atheists out there. Uh, muse means to think. Amuse means to not think. That is the meaning of the word. We have entire parks where you can pay money and go do that. They're called amusement parks. Okay? You two guys from Central Florida know about all the amusement parks down there, right? People will spend a fortune to be amused. The Romans did this 2,000 years ago. They bring in the lions, bring in the Christians. We want to be amused seeing them ripped apart, you know? Bread and circus. And when people get to that point where they're more worried about their sports and their games and their amusements than they are about thinking, this is a, amusement is a great tool for politicians to use to keep the people from thinking for themselves. Karl Marx in the Communist Manifesto said one of the things you have to do is get the people's minds off their leader. Not when the Communist Manifesto was in the Communist Rules Revolution. Get the people's minds off their leaders, get them thinking about sports, trivial things that don't matter. Who's going to care who threw the ball through the hoop a hundred years from now? Who's going to care? But people today get all bent out of shape over, wow, who's going to win the World Series or who's going to win the Super Bowl? It doesn't matter. But it's a great distraction. It is just like the uh, thing you wind up over the baby's crib, you know, the little mobile. The kid's crying. We got, I got four grandkids, three and under, you know, and it's so easy to get them distracted, you know. Just like little Matthew last night, he's what, 10 months old, you know watching Matthew last night. All you got to do is, when he gets, he gets fussy over something, hey, Matthew. Huh. <laughs> it, you know, that's one of the characteristics of, you know, a 10-month-old brain, okay? <laughs> Just very easy to distract. Teenagers and adults can be the same way, though. Very easily distracted on absolutely dumb stuff. It's not going to matter. We ought to be concerned about who's going to heaven or hell and about who's going to be our leaders in our government. And, you know, we ought to be concerned about deeper issues, but... 
the politicians have learned, hey, keep the people distracted, give them bread and circus, and they won't worry about these things. If, any, if ever something is in the news that's usually, you would think, man, that's kind of stupid. Usually there's a, something bigger behind the news that they're trying to hide. For instance, O.J. Simpson. How long was that on TV and in the news? Uh, a year? Whatever, okay. Months and months and months of the O.J. Simpson trial. Well, behind the scenes was Bill Clinton trying to give, you know, the Los Angeles port to China. China Gate. But they try to cover that up. Whenever there's something in the news, like it's all big news, all the news media is covering, you know, something about, you know, some murder. Yes, sir. I remember um, at a skating, the ice skating um, competition, the World the Olympics, when uh, Nancy, they were thinking maybe um, Nancy, Kerrigan. Nancy Kerrigan was attacked by, you know, the other girl. Right. But they, they thought, you know, all this thing's going on, really big thing. But at the same time, HR6 was going through trying to make sure that homes, trying to make the homeschoolers Parents have to have, you know, degrees to go through, and they, you know, they're trying to distract them. Get something in the news to distract people from the real issue, the homeschool bill or the whatever, you know. And that, politicians are great at this. They've got, you know, decades and centuries of practice at it, you know, and they're really good at it. So be careful. I'm not against amusements, you know. My kids, when they were like, I don't know, 9, 10, 11, I think, right about that age, we were going to go down here to Orlando to Disney. And I said, kids, we're going on a Tuesday, and it's a kind of a light day. There aren't going to be as many people there as there are weekends, so let's have an experiment here. Let's see how much time we actually spend on the ride. When we're done with the ride, we're going to run and get to the next one and get in line. As soon as we get up there, as soon as the ride starts moving, click, start the clock. As soon as it stops moving, stop the clock. We were there for 12 hours trying to see how much time we could get in. Anybody want to take a wild guess how much actual ride time we had in 12 hours? An hour? 29 minutes. <laughs> you, know how much, you know how much action time there is in an average Major League Baseball game? Not standing at the mound, not winding up. I mean, actual action. 11 minutes. <laughs> in a Major League ball game, which takes, what, two or three hours, you know? <laughs> We just get amused over the dumbest things, and it's distraction. Disney's got it down to a science. I mean, when you run to get 30 minutes of ride time in for what? What's it cost to get in there now? 40 bucks? 50? Okay. 50 bucks for 30 minutes. That's $100 an hour I paid per, per kid, okay, of actual ride time. The rest of the time you're standing in line like a bunch of cows, you know, move up a step, you know, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. They got it down to a science, okay? So you're paying, you know, while you stand there in line. And of course, the longer you stand there, the more hungry you get. And then you buy the $5 hot dog and the $3 Coke, and they got more money that way. I'm used. Psalm 8, he said, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon, the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Now look what happened to King David here. When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon, the stars, what is man that thou art mindful of him? When you start looking at what God has done, you start realizing how insignificant we are. And I tell parents, you better go home and look in your kid's bedroom. And if what you see all over the walls are pictures of sports heroes, you better stop and think what you're doing to this kid. You are developing in him a very shallow personality where the depth of his understanding is, wow, he threw the ball through the hoop. Oh, <laughs> no depth of thinking, no understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. You know, you're not going to raise a leader that way. Just absolutely no depth of character. The secret is very simple. When I consider thy heavens... Take time to talk to God. Take time to just listen to God. The Bible says, I think it's Ecclesiastes, you know, when you go into the house of the Lord, let thy words be few. Uh, what is that? Where's that phrase at? Let me get that open here. I, I, I hate to say that. I don't want this to sound right or sound wrong, okay? But I don't pray much as far as talking to God. I pray a lot, but I just say, Lord, talk to me, you know. Words... 
be few. Ecclesiastes 5. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. Don't be in a hurry to say something in front of God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. I know people, you know, they'll pray for an hour, and they ask God for this, and they tell God how he ought to be running the universe, and they're just busy telling God everything, you know. Okay, I just... How many of you ever made a promise to God and later found out you couldn't keep it? God, I promise I'm going to read my Bible five hours a day or something like that, you know. We all do that. It's better not to vow than to vow and not pay. We find that verse here. Not to vow. And that's verse 5 of the same chapter. Oh, yeah, okay, right there. Uh, verse 3. For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it. For he hath no pleasure in fools, pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow, than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. I guess, as a young Christian, I read this and was really impacted by it and said, Man, we're talking about God here. I'm not going to make any promises I can't fulfill. And I saw all kinds of kids in the youth group. They would, after a good, powerful sermon, they would walk down to the front and say, God's called me to be a missionary, and God's called me to, you know, whatever, okay? I didn't do that. I, I might go be a missionary, but I'm not going to get up here and tell everybody God called me to do it, and I'm not going to promise God. I try to be very cautious in what promises I make. My wife will tell you, it frustrates her to death, you know? Uh, I just, I'm cautious. You know, let thy words be few. And see, you're dealing with God here. When you're in front of a judge in court uh, or on, on a witness stand, you have to do the very same thing. Bill Clinton was uh, in front of the grand jury for four hours and 30 seconds and didn't say anything they could hang him on. What he would do, he would question everything that they asked him. He would question every word. Well, that depends what you mean by is, you know. What do you mean by is, <laughs> you know. Of course, it drove everybody crazy, but he's a lawyer. And he's, you know, crooked as a dog's hind leg. But uh, he probably, he never did really perjure himself. Because what you do, after you question their question, over and over and over, then you say, well, if I understand your question correctly, my answer is, you know, blah, blah, blah. And when they try to hang you with your answer, well, I must not have understood your question correctly. Let your words be few. I've been several times now in front of the judge and uh, over this building permit issue, and I have just tried to learn, just say the minimum. We were at the hearing just last week and uh, uh, of the building, you know, the four-hour hearing over the building permit, and uh, the attorney for the state, the county attorney, said, uh, Mr. Hovind, does your son live next to you? I said, no, ma'am. And she was shocked. Are you saying your son does not live next to you? Yes, ma'am. He doesn't. He lives two doors down. I'm not about to volunteer any information. It really threw, threw her off stride, you know. Now, for the record, you're saying your son does not live next to you? Yes, ma'am. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> it was hilarious, you know. Let thy words be few, you know. The police know when they get somebody in there and start interrogating them, just let them talk. Eventually, they'll say something you can hang them with, okay? When you're in front of an adversary, keep quiet. Let thy words be few. Don't say much. When you're in front of somebody that's out to get you, just shut up. You have the right to remain silent. Yes, sir. I think I'll do that. I'll stay silent. And it, you know... Uh, we can go off on a long rabbit trail there, but we better stop, okay? Uh, so, what is man that thou, a person that spends his time considering what God has done really quickly understands man is nothing. We just are pretty insignificant in the big picture. And when somebody really thinks they're the coolest thing since sliced bread, you know, they just need to go out and get a good view of who God is. I've got the video clip of uh, uh, the one woman standing on the beach, uh, McLean, Shirley McLean. She's standing out on the beach saying, I'm God. I'm God. 
and she's talking to the ocean, you know, I'm God. <laughs> How stupid can you get? <laughs> Absolutely stupid. So I use that in my uh, video five, you know, uh, somebody's saying, I'm God. And then you back up and you show just the earth and a little dot on there, you know, I'm God. And you back up and show the whole solar system, little tiny earth, little bitty dot. I'm God. And you back up and show the whole universe, you know, a little tiny dot. I'm God. No, you're not God. You're nothing. Okay. Absolutely. How many have seen that read the book, uh, uh, Horton Hears a Who, you know, from uh, uh, Seuss? Great story. Okay. All this takes place on a little bitty speck of dust, you know, that you can't even see. You know, this whole little kingdom down there. We think we're, we're cool. Ben Franklin was a brilliant man, ungodly man in many ways, but he was a brilliant man. He wrote a, a, a short story. The name of it was something about seven seconds on the, uh, in the life of an insect on a plant or something, you know. And these insects are on this plant and have a really short lifespan, like, you know, a couple of minutes or something, you know. That's all they live some kind of imaginary creature. And the one was saying, yes, I've lived on this plant now for about, you know, 48 seconds, and you've only lived here for 20 seconds, so let me give you some advice, you know. Just showing the, how, how insignificant we are, you know. When my kids were young, you know, and they were going through questions and decisions they got to make, you know, about, wow, you know, what should I do? And it, all my friends are doing this. Is it okay if I do this? And what I would do is I would take a tape measure, stretch it out on the ground, 80 inches. Got this tape measure laying on the ground, 80 inches long. I'd say, now kids, let's assume you're going to live to be 80 years old. That's reasonable. You could live to be 80, no problem. Each one of these inches represents a year. Just take this penny and put it where you are now. Okay, right now you are 14. You have to go from here to there when you die. Is it possible for you to make a decision right here that will hurt you for the next... 65 years. I mean, if you decide to drink alcohol or take drugs or, you know, get pregnant or whatever, okay, if you make this decision at 14 or 15 or 16, look at your life. You're a long ways from the end. Be real careful what decisions you make here. Like devotions Dan had this morning, you know, about interview the older people. If you could do it over again, what would you do? I'd floss my teeth more. I have had, you know, uh, lots of dental work done. And every time I sit in the dental chair, boy, I'm thinking, I learned too late, you know. Take care of that second set of teeth. That's the last one you're going to get, you know. Brush them, floss them, you know, don't eat junk food. <laughs> we all learn those lessons too late. Take care of our health. You know, when the red light comes on the dash of your car, and you hear your engine going clang, 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 and you boy, I really should have changed oil more often, you know. Should have taken better care of that engine. <laughs> You've all done that kind of thing, you know. Uh, we need to just develop the, a godly perspective of life and see who we are. And, you know, we got this, I got one life. I don't know when mine's going to end. I'm 52. Okay, let's assume I live to be 80. Well, then I'm two-thirds done. People say, Verhoeven, you, you're always going. Why don't you slow down and rest? Man, my life's nearly over. I got a lot more to get done yet. They're going to put on my tombstone. So much to do. So little done. Farewell. You know, <laughs> that's it, you know. One guy, one friend of mine in South Florida, uh, he collects epitaphs off of tombstones. Has some hilarious ones. One guy's name was Pease, P-E-A-Z was his name. And on his tombstone it said, Here lies the body of old man Pease beneath the shadow of the trees. But Pease ain't here, it's just the pod, because Pease shelled out and went to God. <laughs> Pretty cute. <laughs> this pastor down there that does this, his name is Don Strange, and he is, you know Don, yeah, he's, he's a strange guy. Uh, great guy. He said, Brother Hovind, when I die, I want a blank tombstone, just nothing on it, blank. People are going to walk by and say, wow, that's strange. <laughs> it's got hundreds and hundreds of those things. Anyway, how do we get off on all that? Okay, tombstone, uh, baseball. Take time to consider what God has done. As a kid, my parents bought me a microscope, one of the best gifts ever. I would take, it wasn't a real powerful one. It had 30, 60, and 100, I think, were the options, okay? It wasn't super powerful. But I spent so many hours looking at things through that microscope. I just look at everything. Look at a dollar bill. Look at a hair. Look at a piece of cloth. Look at a piece of rug, you know? Look at a hair off a dog. How's a dog hair compared to a human hair, you know? Spent hours and hours and hours, hundreds of hours, just looking through the microscope at everything. 
start off with a magnifying glass. You know, my mom and dad were just really good teachers, and they taught us, all of us kids, to just enjoy learning, you know. Whenever we traveled, as a kid, we took a vacation. Every year went somewhere, all piled in the Volkswagen, and uh, <laughs> drove clear across country, and we would stop and see everything. You know, go see the world's largest ball of yarn in, or ball of uh, baling rope in uh, Darwin, Iowa. I mean, Darwin, Iowa has probably a population of eight or whatever, you know. <laughs> you drive off the road and it's got the sign, you know, world's largest ball of baling twine or whatever it was, you know. And you, I got a picture of me standing next to the world's largest. I mean, it's huge, just, you know, 10, 12 feet tall, you know. Why would people do that, make the world's largest ball of baling yarn or wire or rope? But we saw it, okay. World's largest acorn, the world's, you know, saw, just traveled, saw everything. But a whole different depth of personality when you just stop and think and learn to enjoy what God has made, other than the ball of yarn. But we'd go see Grand Canyon, go see the Grand Tetons, you know, go see things. Shut off the TV, just go see what God has done. Take time to consider the heavens. The last estimate in 2003, the Hubble had uh, took a bunch of pictures called Deep Field. What was the picture the name of the uh, Deep Space? I forget the name, it doesn't matter. They took a whole bunch of pictures of one spot in space. The spot was about the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length. You hold a grain of sand out there at arm's length, they focused on a spot that big for 10 days and took hundreds and hundreds of pictures of that spot. They counted how many stars in that spot and then calculated based on how many of those spots would fit, you know, at that range to cover the whole heaven and said, there are enough stars out there that we can see. There are 70 sextillion stars. If you learn a little Latin, you can count to really huge numbers. You got mono, bi, tri, quad, quint, sex, sept, oct, nove, dec. So a septillion has 70 sets of zeros. I mean, sorry, 70. A septillion has seven sets of zeros plus the original thousand. So you have uh, 24 zeros in a septillion. 70 septillion would be a 7 with 25 zeros after it. That's how many stars the people at the Hubble Telescope Observatory said, yep, that's about how many stars we can see. Well, that divides out with 6 billion people on the planet to each person being able to own 11 trillion stars to yourself. Those are just the ones we can see, okay? That doesn't count the ones we don't know about. That's a lot. 11 trillion stars per person. I think we should take time to consider the heavens. Why did God make all that? Maybe it's just for the oh wow factor. You know, why do people put chrome on their car? I saw one truck show on TV flipping through channels. This guy had chrome plated everything under his truck, you know, the, the leaf springs, the drive shaft, the axle. Of course, you can't see it under the truck, so he cut the bed out of the truck and put a big piece of plexiglass in there so you could see his chrome plating. Of course, now you can't use the truck to haul anything because you're going to scratch the plexiglass. Duh. <laughs> Absolutely stupid. But why do people put chrome plate all that stuff? Why do they have chrome bumpers on a car and chrome stripes and pin stripes and all? It's just for the, oh, wow, that's cool, you know? God, the ultimate owner of everything, has infinite amount of money. It's no problem for him to go, hey, you want to see the oh wow? Watch this. Step outside in the dark night. Get away from all these lights. Wow. But we sometimes can't see the stars because there's too much city light. There's just too much light in our eyes, you know? And I don't think we really see the importance of God and his creation because we've got too many things distracting us. We're too worried about the new shoes and the new car and, you know, the new house and the, you know, we're just, we're focusing on the wrong stuff. Once in a while you need to clear your eyes and just get away from all this distraction. As a kid, I was a real loner and I used to go out and camp out by myself. Just take my little tent, go out in the woods, camp out, and just lay down, and just watch the stars and think. No radio, just think. And that can be discouraging, especially if you're not a Christian. But if a person will do that for a while, like the young prince, just take 30 minutes a day and go think, man, pretty soon you're going to be a good king. You're going to think about what's important. You know, this party I'm planning tonight is really not important. In the, in the big span of things, this is not important. 
Take time to think. The Bible says, Speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee. Job 12. Interesting passage. The earth. Well, the earth is like a big magnet. Magnets lose their strength over time. You buy the re magnet to go on your refrigerator, you know, John loves Mary. And about the time the magnet starts sliding down the refrigerator, your love for Mary also starts, you know, sliding down and you go look for somebody else, you know. <laughs> um, magnets lose their strength. The Earth's magnet has lost 10% of its strength in the last 150 years. A guy named Gauss, G-A-U-S-S, -S, I believe is the spelling. Don't, don't trust me on that one, believe me. But Gauss is the guy who developed a method of measuring how strong is the Earth's magnetic field. And they actually measure magnetic strength in how many Gauss it is. You can get a Gauss meter. Okay? The Gauss meter developed, you know, how strong is the magnetic pull? You've all seen magnets, you know, you get them close together, all of a sudden, bam, and you just, you cannot pull them apart. Uh, I was at a science center one time and they had this, you know, electromagnet where you, you know, you put, hold a piece of metal on there and you pull it off and then you hit the button and hold it on there, bam, and you can't pull it off. You know, you can get a team of horses trying to pull that thing off and it just won't come. Big, powerful electromagnet. Well, magnetic fields are measured in Gauss, and the Earth's magnetic field has been observed and measured for uh, the last 150 years, and it has declined 10%, which is very significant. There was a teacher of physics at the University of Texas, El Paso. He died several years ago. His name was Thomas G. Barnes. Thomas G. Barnes, uh, physics professor, UT El Paso, uh, did a lot. Of, he was a creationist did a lot of studies on the Earth's magnetic field. He wrote papers for the government. He studied the Earth's magnetic field, did a lot of research on this. He said there is no possible way the Earth is, is even 25,000 years old. If you go back in time, the magnetic field would be stronger. Quite obviously, it's losing strength, okay? It's lost 40% in the last 1,000 years. Now, that number is only known from what's called paleomagnetism, where they test the magnetic strength of a rock that formed like a lava flow that formed a thousand years ago, how strong is the magnetic field in those rocks? Because then if the magnetic signature is kind of locked in to rocks at that time. But uh, Astronomy in the Bible, a book we sell in the bookstore by Donald DeYoung, uh, has a good article about that. Uh, ICR, Institute for Creation Research, has a lot of information about this. Uh, CreationScience.com, which is Walt Brown's website, has a ton of stuff on this. Uh, uh, Earth's magnetic field is declining. Well, we'll take a break here in a second. The, Earth's magnetic field is getting weaker. That is a, an established fact. That means it can't be more than, say, 25,000 years old. Interesting thought. According to NASA, I believe NASA is the one that said the Earth's magnetic field's half-life is 1,400 years. Half of the magnetic field is gone every 1,400 years. So if you go back in time 1,400 years, it was twice as strong. You go back 2,800 years to about the time of King David, it was four times as strong. You go back another half-life, another 1,400 years, say the time of the flood, just before the flood, the magnetic field will be eight times as strong as it is today. You go back to the creation of Adam, it's probably 15 times stronger than it is today. Well, if the magnetic field were that strong, some strange things would happen. You've got iron in your body. You know, they talk about iron poor blood, okay? What if you could feel which way is north? Can anybody point to north right now? Got three say that way. Josh, you're going with the crowd or you think that's north? I think that's he thinks it's that way. Diane, which way is north? This way. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever been disoriented? I mean, like lost? That's a, that's, a, that's a weird feeling, and it's, it's uncomfortable, okay? Well, if God made the Garden of Eden absolutely perfect, perfect, Adam and Eve had a lot of features that we probably don't even think about. They probably had a built-in GPS. You could not get lost. You always knew exactly where you were in relation to the Earth, based on the magnetic field. Birds navigate by the magnetic field. Uh, bees Go out and find the honey, come back, or go find the nectar and navigate by the magnetic field. The Pacific Golden Plover. Little bird goes to Alaska, mates, lays its eggs, hatches the eggs, raises the birds up, gets them to a certain size, says, okay, Junior, I'm taking off. Mom and Dad fly to Hawaii, over 2,000 miles of ocean. 
Two weeks later, Junior flies to Hawaii. Think about that. He's never been to Hawaii. He was <laughs> conceived and born in Alaska. Do you realize if he's a half degree off in his navigation, he's going to miss Hawaii by, you know, 300 miles? There's not much around Hawaii but ocean, okay? I've been there a couple times, okay? How, how could such a thing evolve? The Pacific Golden Plover. Well, we'll take a break, cover more on the magnetic field when we get back. But the Earth's magnetic field is a powerful indication the Earth is not billions of years old. It cannot be. Because if you went back stronger and stronger magnetic field, now it starts to generate heat. And it melts everything on Earth. The heat generated would have destroyed the planet 25,000 years ago. So how do they answer that? Well, we'll cover that when we get back from the break. Okay, okay let's take up where we left off here. The Earth's magnetic field is getting weaker. That is an established scientific fact. Which means, it, at the rate it is declining, it cannot be more than 25,000 years old. Now, for an evolutionist, of course, they're going to have to have an answer for this. What are they going to say? They're not going to admit it's less than 25,000 years old. That it's kind of up or That it's, no, well, that's one. The chain, rate of change has not been the same. But they'll say, oh, no, the magnetic field is reversing. It declines for a while, and then it reverses and, you know, increases and declines. And they're uh, reversing the flipping magnetic field is their answer to this, okay? There is no proof of the Earth's magnetic field ever flipping. Okay, none. Uh, there's no even good theory how it could flip. But that's their answer to it. This also means carbon dating cannot work. We'll get into much more of this later, but give you a brief synopsis here. Radiation from the sun, primarily some from the stars, comes through the atmosphere, hits nitrogen, which is the most abundant gas in the, in the atmosphere. 80% of the Earth is, or 79% is uh, 21% oxygen, 78% nitrogen, and a little bit of the other two gases, uh, the other six or eight to ten gases in there. Well. Um, the nitrogen gets bombarded by the cosmic radiation and it turns it into carbon-14. If the Earth's magnetic field were stronger, there would be less radiation getting in and therefore less carbon-14 would be formed. So plants and animals that lived under a stronger magnetic field would have less carbon-14 in them. And so when you date them, they're going to look like they're much older than they really are. They just simply lived in a world that had a stronger magnetic field. Carbon dating cannot possibly work. And I give a couple examples. We give more in video 7. But in 1949, when they first invented carbon dating, the lower leg of a mammoth from Fairbanks, Alaska, dated, had a radiocarbon age of 15,000 RCY, which is radiocarbon years, okay? While the skin and flesh were 21,000 radiocarbon years. How can the skin be 6,000 years older than the leg. It doesn't work. One part of a mammoth dated 29,000 years old, another part dated 44,000. I'd like to point out something that ought to be kind of obvious here. Both numbers can't be right. Would you agree? It can't be both 29 and 44. So, we know one of the numbers is wrong, right? How would you know either of them are right? Is there any possible way to know that either number is right? If you're getting two numbers from the same critter, you got to stop and think. Either you got a really slow birth here, it took him, you know, uh, what, 15,000 years to finish being born, or you're, you're, it doesn't work. Your carbon dating doesn't work. In spite of all the theories, in practice, it doesn't work. Much more on that on video seven, question and answer, which will be to in about eight years at the rate we're going. Okay, here's the evolutionist answer to the declining magnetic strength. They know the magnetic field's declining. Never had an argument on this. So they'll say, well, there are magnetic reversals. See, this textbook says there's reversed polarity. What they say is, as the ocean floor spreads, the magma comes up in the middle and the ocean mid-Atlantic ridge is spreading out, which is probably is true, kind of like a big conveyor belt, maybe true, I don't argue about that. But they'll say, as the magnetic field flips, it is recorded and preserved in these rocks, the paleomagnetism. It's locked into the rock. 
and they show this alternating polarity of the bands, you know, you got the red bands and the gray bands, they say the polarity is going opposite direction. This is absolutely pure propaganda, okay, it is not true, we cover much more on that on video 6, but uh, Walt Brown has a great section on his website, creationscience.com, about this phenomena. There is not, there are not magnetic reversals. What it was, it was stronger and weaker magnetism they were measuring. And somebody drew a line through the middle of this, called a sine wave, you know, up, down, up, down, up, down. And they drew a line through the middle and called everything below average a reversal. If we lined up everybody in, you know, Pensacola and found the average height is five foot six, okay? Does that mean anybody who's under five foot six is reversed, i.e. down in the ground? Or does it mean they're just lower than average? It doesn't mean they're reversed and sticking down in the ground, okay? It just means they're lower than average height. That's all it means. And so areas of weaker magnetism does not mean it is reversed. He covers in his website uh, and on his videotape that he did, which is great, on probably when the, earth, when the fountains of the deep broke open, the, ma the basalt, there's a layer of rock, the granite rocks of the crust of the earth, then there was a layer of water, and then a layer of basalt, which is hardened lava, okay? As the basalt would bulge up, it would crack. You try to bend a rock, eventually it's going to crack. Water's going to rush into those cracks and cool it off. The basalt is, you know, close to the uh, moho or visic discontinuity, the place where it changes over to a liquid in the center of the earth, or toward the center. Well, the bulging basalt would crack and the water's going to rush in, cooling it down along the cracks. So, hot rock does not store a magnetic field. If you put a magnet in your oven and heat it up, it'll lose all of its magnetism as it gets warm. So what they were measuring was where the cracks were, probably from the fountains of the deep breaking open. And they were measuring stronger and weaker magnetism based on the magnetic signature found in the rocks at the bottom of the ocean. It's true there are different intensities, but it's not true that there are reversals. How they did that, I don't know. That's part of the Pangea theory. How many have ever heard of Pangea? Textbooks will teach, oh yes, boys and girls, millions of years ago, all the continents fit together, right? They don't ever tell the kids they had to shrink Africa 35 to 40 percent to make them fit. Why wouldn't they bring that up? Well, we don't want to confuse the kids, you know. Oh, you don't want to present the facts because you want them to believe your theory. Is that the way this goes? Okay. They don't tell them that Mexico and Central America are gone. Take a look at any map of Pangaea. Hey, senor, donde esta Mexico, Panama, Costa Rica, Guatemala, right? They're gone. Josh, you're going to be a missionary down there? Well, you couldn't have done it 200 million years ago. There was no Mexico, okay? Uh, they don't tell them that they twisted Africa clockwise and twisted South America counterclockwise. Notice on the map, Africa and South America look about the same size. Grab that globe up there, would you, Albert, and toss that up here? Uh, I don't want to get my microphone wires messed up. You take a look at a globe, not a map, okay, a globe, where you get the actual scale. <laughs> Africa is huge compared to South America. Everybody pass that around in a second here. South America, right here, about that far across the bulk of it. Africa is gigantic. Take a look for yourself. It's just not logical to say, just, how do they get by with this stuff? You know, where, where's somebody with a brain saying, oh, excuse me, wait a minute. One, uh, the uh, textbook, uh, I forget where it was in, in Texas, the uh, Gabler's, Gabler's caught it. One of the textbooks they tried to get uh, to sell to Texas had the equator, the equator going through Florida. This is, uh, kids are going to learn this on a map, you know. Okay, kids, study your geography for tomorrow. Where's the equator? It goes through Florida. You're going to mess that kid up for the rest of his life. One of the textbooks had uh, George Washington was Abraham Lincoln's vice president. Oh, only about 60 years different in time frame, you know. <laughs> no, he wasn't, George Washington. Oh, brother. But the Gabler's uh, textbookreviews.org, they've got reviews of all kinds of textbooks showing just some unbelievable things that they're in there. Like, hello, does anybody have a brain out there? Like that uh, Ernest uh, movie... What was the one where he said, everybody works around here a moron, you know, Ernest robs the bank or whatever it was, you know, Ernest goes to jail, that was it, that was hilarious. 
Everybody that works around here a moron. Well, yeah, uh, they got to be morons. They, they made Africa the same size as South America. It is not. Okay? Hey, Diane, make a note for me to find out how many square miles Africa is, and I'll stick that on the map, and how many square miles all of South America is. Total square miles for each continent. In your Pangea map, they look the same size. They shrank Africa a lot to make them fit. They also don't tell you what I think really ought to be obvious to a kindergartner, okay? If you take the water out of the oceans, you will notice there is dirt underneath. The oceans actually have a, f a bottom to them, a floor, right? These continents are not lily pads floating around in a bathtub, okay? The earth has a continuous solid crust. And so when somebody says to me, do you think the continents were ever connected? I say, well, what do you mean? They're still connected right now. Right this minute, the continents are connected. It's just the low places are full of water, right? Doesn't mean they're not connected. Duh. My house and the neighbor's house would fit perfectly if you slid them together. What does that prove? Nothing. Okay. The opposite sides of quite a few rivers would fit perfectly. Take a look at the river, you know, same width, follows the same curves. See? What does that prove, huh? <laughs> Nothing, all right? It doesn't prove the earth split open there and the river oozed up in between, all right? It's just a coincidence based on the water level. The shapes of the continents that we see today is a pure coincidence based on the water level. If you raise or lower the water just a few hundred feet, everything changes. Figure, the oceans average 12,000 feet deep. We were driving back last two days from Chicago, Hammond, Indiana, my family, and we had my little GPS sitting on the dash of the bus, you know, keeping track of how, where we are, how fast we're going, you know, in case we get lost. And it also shows elevation. Did you know Chicago is 600 feet above sea level? 600 feet, you know, from here to building eight. That's it. And it's a long ways to the beach from Chicago. If the oceans, they're at 12,000 feet deep, if you raised them another 600 feet, what's that, 5%? Uh, Chicago would be underwater. Whole United States would look a lot different. We cover more on that on video six, anyway, about the ocean. So this whole Pangea theory is dumb. We cover much more on that in seminar part six. Uh, if you want to get, can't wait to get all that, watch that one. Okay, the Earth is spinning about 1,000 miles an hour at the equator. Technically, it's 1,041.6, I believe. You could take the diameter of the Earth divided by the 24 hours it takes to go around, you know, who cares? But the Earth is spinning, we all know that. It's about 1,041 miles an hour at the equator. I would, even that would depend upon your altitude, I know. Somebody's going to call in and say, well, that depends if you're 80 feet above sea level or 800 feet. I understand, the circle's bigger, I taught geometry, but who cares? But the Earth is spinning, but the Earth is slowing down, okay? We're actually slowing down in the Pensacola News Journal about... 15 years ago, they ran an article that said in 1990, this was just before New Year's Eve, you know, what, a couple weeks before New Year's Eve, give 1990 one last tick before ushering in 1991. What's this all about? Well, when you count off the final seconds of 1990, wait just an instant before cheering in 1991. By international agreement, an extra tick will be placed between 1990 and 1991 to keep regular clocks in line with atomic clocks. Atomic clocks are tuned to a particular quiver of the cesium atom and are accurate to a billionth of a second a day. But regular clocks use days as a measure, which are growing longer by a thousandth of a second or more daily as Earth's rotation slows. The Earth is slowing down for several known reasons, okay? If you look at the Earth, we're spinning toward the east, the crust of the Earth is solid rock, but only about 20 or 30 miles, which at this scale is about as thick as the paper on this globe, okay? 20 miles compared to 8,000 is 2 to 800, 1 to 400, okay? This is, what, a 12-inch globe, so 1 400th of the thickness of the radius would be the thickness of the crust of the Earth. Really not much. The Earth is about like a balloon would be a good analogy. The thickness of the rubber compared to the balloon is about how thick the crust is compared to the Earth. The inner part, as far as we know, is liquid. Well, if I was spinning this thing and it was full of water, the liquid on the inside would create friction 
and quickly slow it down. Once you get the whole thing spinning, there is still a little problem with the, the movement of the liquid inside is going to be moving around as opposed to the surface, which is more rigid, the crust of the Earth. So the liquid center to the Earth creates a dragging motion on the spinning. It, doesn't, it gradually slows it down. Two other things enter into slowing the Earth down. As the Earth spins, the, the moon is pulling the water up, called the tide. Well, as the Earth turns, that tidal bulge is constantly moving around the Earth, okay? We're turning toward the east, so the tidal bulge is going toward the west. For instance, Pensacola is going to get the tide uh, a few minutes before Mobile gets it, gets the high tide, if all other factors are equal. The other things play into it here, like the shape of the topography of the land and all that, but who cares? Well, this tidal bulge, the tide washing up onto the beach, is a lot of water. It's heavy. You know, a gallon of water is 8 pounds, a cubic foot of water is 64 pounds. You get a few thousand bazillion gallons of water smashing up on the beach. Even though it slowly comes up and you know, goes back down, that tide, tidal bulge, creates a breaking action, slows the earth down. The third factor that slows the earth down is prevailing wind currents. Because the earth is turning, hot air rises, so the air near the equator tends to go up. The sailing ships discovered this the hard way. As they're trying to sail back in the 1500s, you know, Columbus, 1492, sailed the ocean blue. As they tried to sail across the ocean, pretty soon they went, started to go across the equator. Let's go to South America. We'll see what they got down there. Let's we'll steal their gold, you know. So as they started, when they got to the equator, the wind whew, quit blowing. The wind is blowing just fine until all of a sudden they get to the equator and it just stopped. Sails went flat. And they're stuck. It's called the doldrums. D-O-L doldrums, something like that. They hit this area and it's like, wow, what do we do now? Get out the oars. Let's row this, you know, 20 bazillion pound boat for the next 300 miles. It was a real problem until they discovered there are some currents they can ride to get across here. But in the days of sailing ships, it was a real problem. If you don't have wind, you're stuck. You've got a real problem on your hands. The reason was because the air is going straight up. The wind was blowing all right, straight up, which doesn't do you any good. You can't use that for sails. At the North Pole, it, cold air sinks, so the cold air was dropping down. You open the freezer, you know, and the cold air rushes out to the floor. Hot air rises, expands, cold air sinks. So if there were no other factors involved, the hot air would rise off the equator, drift over to the poles, sink at the poles, the air would blow along the surface of the Earth toward the equator, rise up, make a great big loop. Problem is it can't quite make it that far. So it actually it's divided up into three loops called the Coriolis effect. We'll get into more of that later. But these, this wind is generally in Pensacola, the wind blows the same direction. You can watch the weatherman, you know, he says, oh, here comes the storms, you know, and typical based on the season, the rain or the wind is always coming from the northwest or other seasons is always coming from the southeast, you know. But these prevailing wind currents Create it, they, they slow the earth down just a little tiny bit. Not much, but it, you know, it's like the wind blowing on your car. You get up to a certain speed, it's 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 miles an hour, the wind starts to become a factor, and you start to lose gas mileage because there's so much wind friction to overcome. Well, the wind on the mountains isn't anything like that, but it's enough to slow the earth down. So the three factors are the internal liquid core, the tide, and the prevailing wind currents. All of those act as a break to slow the earth down. That's been known for a long time. And it's been known that the Earth is slowing down. It would have to be slowing down, which raises a couple of questions. How fast can it keep this up? How long can it keep this up, I mean? At what point will it slow down to a dead stop? Oh, with a, with a ball this big and this heavy, I mean, Earth weighs like six sextillion tons. It's going to take a long time, long time to slow it down, to stop it. But obviously, quite obviously, it used to be going faster. Well, if the Earth was going faster, you start to create a problem. Here's an astronomy magazine, June of 92. They said Earth's rotation is slowing down. To compensate for this lagging motion, June will be one second longer than normal. This leap second announced by the International Earth Rotation Service in February will keep calendar time in close alignment with international time. Because of the slowing Earth, eventually a day is no longer 24 hours. Now it's slightly longer because the Earth is going slower. 
They've had leap seconds since uh, 1973. Usually, they used to do it every year, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79, 80, and then they started going uh, half a year, six months, or no, a year and a half. Sometimes it's, you know, July, 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 and then January, 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 about every year to year and a half, somewhere in there, we have to add a second to the clock. People say, who cares? What? Well, if the Earth's only 6,000 years old, that really is not a big deal. Adam's day was probably just a little bit shorter, actually because the earth was spinning just a little bit faster. Adam wouldn't notice. He didn't have a watch, as far as we know. So you people that like to sleep in, hey, rejoice. You know, your day's probably a second or two longer than Adam's was. You probably got more time to sleep. <laughs> Big deal. But if you want to go back millions of years, you're going to really create a problem in a hurry. Millions of years ago, the earth would have been going real fast. These are those loops I was telling you about, the prevailing wind current. It's called the Coriolis effect. Because the hot air rises, cold air sinks, and because the earth turns, the air, the loops, instead of just going straight toward the equator, they kind of go at an angle. That's why the prevailing wind currents usually are out of, out of the northeast or out of the northwest, depending on your latitude. You get up above a certain latitude and the wind currents change. There's another place where the air is dropping straight down. So the sailboats have a hard time going through there because the wind is you know, coming down instead of out. Once you get to a certain line, you lose all your wind. Your sails go flat. You're stuck again. Get out the oars, you know, or latch onto a whale. Let him pull you across. Um, if the Earth is only 6,000 years old, it's not a problem. If you go back millions of years, you create a problem. I tell kids, you know, if you think dinosaurs lived 200 million years ago, I know what happened to them. They got blown off. Now, actually, 200 million years ago, the Earth would not have been going fast enough to blow anything off. Okay, centrifugal force would have been a little greater. And it's just a joke about the dinosaurs flying off 200 million years ago. But it would have been going, it, at some point, you're going to create a problem. You're certainly going to create a problem with uh, um, photo, um, there's a term for it, the length of days that plants have to have, they have to have a certain number of daylight hours in order to flower, okay? And plants lose their, trees lose their leaves, not based on temperature, but based on the length of the day. I mean, as soon as the day gets too short, they start dropping their color out of their leaves. And I was just up north and saw all the beautiful colors up there, you know. How many have seen the leaves change colors, you know? Uh, we got to see that this last week. Down in Florida, you don't get much of that, okay? But this phenomena would have been greatly affected if the earth were going faster. Now your days are shorter and your nights are shorter. It's going to greatly upset all this stuff. Another F indicator that shows the, the earth is not billions of years old. What I do in my seminar, uh, and we're going to cover these here, I go through uh, different ways to show the Earth is not billions of years old. I take a whole bunch of things from Earth, a bunch of things from space, and a bunch of things from biology, living systems. That's how I've divided up my young Earth proofs, okay? Into three general categories, Earth science categories, space science categories, and biological categories. And a fourth one, I guess I have, historical categories. The evidences that I used are divided into those four, four, four uh, categories. The Sahara Desert, and actually Sahara means desert. So to call it Sahara Desert is being redundant. You're saying the desert, desert. And people can point that out to me. Atheists will say, well, you don't even know. I guess I know that. And they, they're so desperate to find something that I'm saying wrong that they'll point that out. Well, Sahara means desert. Okay, well, everybody on earth calls it the Sahara Desert. Okay, <laughs> but technically it's the Sahara. Anyway, the Sahara has a prevailing wind pattern. The wind generally blows from the east across the desert to the west, which causes a phenomena over here in Pensacola, Florida, called what? Hurricanes. Hurricanes. That's exactly correct. That's where they start, right there. The process of deserts uh, having a prevailing wind pattern is pretty common, and it, r it results in a, the desert growing. The hot air comes off the desert, kills the trees next door. That area becomes desert. The process is called desertification. Once an area becomes desert, it is basically, unless really special things happen, it is unreclaimable. The soil becomes sterilized. You can take all the plants you want out to the Sahara Desert, stick them in there, and water them like crazy, and they will still die. There is no nourishment left in the soil. It's gone. It's leached out, bleached out, dried out, whatever happened to it, it's gone. So. Once an area becomes desert, it is really tough to reclaim it. It can be done, 
but it's very, very tough. A big study was done on Sahara Desert. It has been known for a long time. Sahara Desert is growing. Actually, today it grows four miles a year. They lose four miles every year to desert. Now think what that does to the farmers living along the edge. It is chaos. It is bringing unbelievable famine to Africa because of the desert. It is growing much faster than it would normally because there's people living along this edge. And they cut down the trees for their firewood. They cut down the trees to cook, you know. They cut down the trees for their houses. And now the desert doesn't have to kill the trees. The farmer killed the trees. Plus all the cows they're raising out there, you know, and overgrazing the grass. And bottom line is, they're speeding up the process by having so many people living along the edge. But it is causing real serious problems in Africa with desertification. They're losing thousands and thousands of acres of farmland every day just because of the desert growing. Even if there weren't people there, it would still happen, but it is happening faster because the people are you know, doing what they're doing. Well, there's a group uh, from Germany went in there and studied this for a while, and they said, you know, Sahara Desert's probably 4,000 years old. Okay, I, I would agree with that. There are historical records of, you know, people living in areas that now you just couldn't live there. Egypt, for instance, had lots of area that was not desert, that now is desert. So, for whatever reason, you know, God allowed this to happen. It's just a phenomena of the way the shape of the earth is and the way the mountains are and the way the winds blow. It just, it happened. Okay, Sahara ends up growing. Well, it's interesting. If the oldest desert is 4,000 years old, I got a question. You know, if the earth is millions of years old, why isn't there a bigger desert? Or why hasn't it stopped growing? run into a border someplace that it can't grow past. Well, the Bible says 6,000 years ago God made everything, and 4,400 years ago there was a flood. It destroyed everything. It's really hard to have a desert under a flood, right? Pretty tough. So I predict, just based on what the Bible teaches, that the oldest desert on the planet will be less than 4,400 years old. And when you look at the evidence, it is. Now, this doesn't prove God made the world in six days, but this is one of those coins in the box, those bits of evidence that says, look, it can't be billions of years old. They're telling me the earth is 4.6 billion years old. Why is the oldest desert only 4,000? This, I suppose, could be uh, similar or equated to a living organism, though it's not living, of course, but it's a, it's a process that we can observe we can see it happening. We can calculate back in time a few thousand years with reasonable accuracy and say, we can tell about when this started. And it started about 4,000 years ago. Okay. That may or may not prove anything for the creation evolution argument, but I point out this is no problem for the creationist, and it may be a problem for the evolutionist. They might have an answer for it. Okay. But to me, it, looked, they would it would be a stretch to fit that into the evolution theory. When you drill into the ground, you hit oil in some places. Uh, oil wells can have pressure up to 20,000 pounds per square inch. Put that in your bike tires and watch what happens. I lived in East Texas, uh, Longview, Texas, where there were 30... It's the smallest county in Texas. I forget how many... I think 30,000 oil wells in, in Gregg County, Texas. Smallest Texas county with 30,000 oil wells, I believe. There was one called the richest acre in the world in Kilgore, Texas, which is 15 miles away. When the oil was first discovered there, they had uh, 28 oil wells on one acre, which is the size of a football field playing surface. 28 oil wells, pumping oil like mad. Bazillions of gallons of oil taken out of the East Texas oil field. Well, the rock on top of this oil is... You know, rock weighs a lot more than water. I don't know the number, but let's just say rock weighs... Uh, if, a, if a cubic foot of water is 64 pounds and rock is, say, six to eight times heavier than that, you're talking, you know, 500 pounds for a cubic foot, 400 pounds probably for a cubic foot of rock. So let's just say 400 pounds per cubic foot. You stack 10 of those up, you've got 4,000 pounds of pressure for every 10 feet of rock. 
you go up a thousand feet, you got a whole lot of weight. Five thousand. Well, in Texas, the oil wells they drill down about three thousand feet, and that's where the oil is. In some places, it's lots deeper. Some places, it's not as deep. But about three thousand feet. Now, the bottom line is the weight of the rock is is a lot, and it supplies quite a bit of that pressure. It's called the overburden. The weight of overburden. That's the rock, the rock on top of what you're going after, which in this case is the oil. But the oil in the the pressure in the oil wells is greater than the weight of overburden. So let's just pick a number here. I'm just picking this wildly, but to give you the concept. If the rock supplies 15,000 pounds per square inch, but the oil well has 20,000 pounds per square inch of pressure in it, where's this extra pressure coming from? And why hasn't it cracked the rock and equalized? Now, there have been many arguments over this issue, okay? Creation Magazine did an article uh, years ago about the oil pressure. Uh, Walt Brown has one on his website, uh, creationscience.com. He says, you know, and many people have said, the oil, the pressure ex excess is not explainable. And I've had evolutionists say, well, the oil migrates into these high pressure zones. Yeah, and a balloon blows itself up too, doesn't it? No, nothing migrates into a high pressure zone. It has to be forced into a high pressure zone. How do you get higher pressure than the weight of overburden? Well, it should have cracked the rock, and the number I have heard from several sources is in 10,000 years, the rock, the pressure would have equalized. So instead of 20,000, it should only be the 15,000 psi, based on just the simple weight of rock. Well, that leaves a couple of obvious questions. You know, where did the oil come from? Why is it still under excess pressure? Excess pressure in oil wells. Well, nearly all textbooks will teach, and I happen to agree with them, that oil comes from organisms that are squished. They're changed by heat and pressure. Kevin, do you know where in the museum the fish is that's made of oil? Is it in the next room there? I don't have, yeah, I do. Can you get that out and bring that in here? Uh, here's a Swiss Army knife with a Phillips screwdriver. This is a piece of uh, shale, oil-bearing shale, from, uh, I don't remember where I got, I think it was Wyoming. I, should, I had a label with it at one time in the museum, and things get moved around and lost, but this is uh, very interesting. You can see as clear as, uh, as it knows on your face, the oil in this rock is a result of fish that are being squeezed. You know, you can cook a fish and get the oil out of it. You can squeeze a fish and get the oil out of it. You can get oil out of a lot of living things, okay? Uh, Hitler got oil out of the Jews, you know, to use for his tanks. He got, you know, baked their bodies to get the oil out of them. Uh, but this uh, fish we have in here, which Kevin's going to get. I should have thought of that before class. Yeah, here we go. You can see the impression of the fish. And if you look at the sides, you'll see there are several more layers where oil is oozing out. This is oil-bearing shale. To get oil out of here, it's a, it's a, you don't just drill a hole and pump it out, okay, because it's all squeezed between these layers. But Kevin, pass it around, let everybody look at that. Try not to touch the fish itself. Hold it by the edge. But there's oil coming out of the crack. Oh, I do have the information on the back. Yeah, where I got it. What's it say on the back? Where did I get that thing? Okay, found in 96 in Connecticut. Connecticut. Hill, Connecticut. Okay. Found in 96 in Connecticut. You can see the impression of the fish plain as day. There is... No question, I guess, that some oil in the ground comes from organisms that are changed by heat and pressure. You get all these fish buried down there in the flood, because fish can drown you know, in a flood. You get a lot of dirt in the water, they can't breathe through their gills, and they drown. Okay? So the fish end up at the bottom. Now layers and layers of sediment get on top of them, squishes them, <laughs> changes them into oil. You can see it there, plain as day. Does it smell like oil, Josh? It's been out for 10 years now, you know, but uh, most scientists agree, like this textbook says, uh, oil and natural gas both are thought to form from the decay of organisms that once lived in the sea, i.e. fish. There you got one, you can hold it for yourself. Um, they're changed by heat and pressure. Well, I, I would agree. Oil comes from organisms that are squished by heat and changed by heat and pressure. Back in 1971, they ran an article in uh, 
um, Bureau of, of Mines, uh, Department of U.S. Department of the Interior, had an article about converting organic waste to oil. They had learned how to take a ton of garbage, heat it, and pressurize it, and produce a barrel of oil in 20 minutes. So why don't they do it? Well, it's just too expensive, okay? The cost of transporting the garbage to the place, of providing the heat to heat it up, providing the pressure to squeeze it, you know, you're going to spend $100 to make a barrel of oil, and you can drill it for $60 or $50 or $20, you know. It's still cheaper to drill for than it is to produce. Yes, you can produce it, but it's not worth the effort yet. It's like there's a lot of gold in places where they, they don't even go dig for it. They know there's gold there, but it's going to cost me $100 to dig out a $50 piece of gold. It's not worth it. Let's wait till the price goes up. Then we'll go dig for it. If the gold becomes worth 200 bucks, well, then, yeah, I'll spend 100 to go dig it out. In 1996, a uh, proposal was approved in Western Australia for $22 million to build an uh, oil production plant next to a sewage plant. Take the sewage under heat and pressure, change it to oil. And they can do it in 30 minutes. Uh, in Texas, just uh, in 90, uh, when was this? 2003, a couple years ago. There's an article uh, in Discover Magazine. Anything to oil is the name of it. Technology savvy could turn 600 million tons of turkey guts and other waste into 4 billion barrels of light Texas crude each year. The guy says, we duplicated what Mother Nature does, but what Mother Nature took millions of years to do, we do in about 30 minutes. They got these factories where they're slaughtering, you know, bazillions of turkeys to package them up and sell them, sell them around the world and sell them. Well, they, they throw away the head, the feet, the feathers, the guts. Somebody said, hey, this is all organic. Let's build a factory that'll take all this stuff and heat it and pressurize it and produce oil. And they're doing it. Taking the turkey guts that they would have thrown away, making oil out of it. It's still not cost effective. You know, the turkeys don't like it at all. Uh, but it, it, the point is, it can be done. So Sinclair, years ago, chose the dinosaur as their logo. Do you guys have Sinclair in Colorado? Sinclair gas stations? California have them? Uh, I've seen them somewhere. Arkansas has them. You know, you're from Arkansas. They got them all over there. Kansas they have, has them. What's that? Kansas, Kansas has them. Yeah. There used to be a lot more. Um, they used to have big fiberglass dinosaurs. Uh, Sinclair. All, I used to love stopping at Sinclair because they had a little small one. You could climb, climb on it while your dad gets gas. You go climb on the dinosaur, you know? Make a note for me to add the picture of me standing by the Sinclair dinosaur to Seminar 1A, Diane, if you would, because I've got a picture of me standing by one. I called Sinclair, and they said, yeah, they come in four fiberglass pieces, pre-molded. They're 1700 bucks, uh, unassembled, if, but we don't sell them to individuals. So, John, you're going to have to build our own here. Okay. Um, this article, by the way, if you look at the one on the right here, this is one I got from the Ruby Tuesdays, no, not Ruby Tuesdays, uh, one of the restaurants over by Cordova Mall, I said, oh, can I borrow that? I want to go scan it into the scanner. What does it say at the bottom? Mellowed 100 million years, right? I found another one. It said mellowed 80 million years. Even Sinclair changed their tune over the years, you know. They said, oh, it took longer for the dinosaurs to form, you know. <laughs> Used to say 80, now it's 100 million. But uh, this, I've got this sign here. Is it here somewhere in the museum, this one? Right there. Right there, okay. Mellow, does it say 80? R say 80 or 100? R says 80. 80, okay. I've got the one that says 80, but this one I got from the restaurant says 100. It's right here in town, over on, what's the restaurant, before you get to Cordova Mall, that uh, has all the signs all over the place inside? Is that Applebee's? Applebee's. I think that's where this one is. Anyway, who cares? But uh, Mellow, 80 million, well, wait a minute. How did the oil get in the ground? Christians ought to have an answer for this. One of our jobs is to be ready always to give an answer, right? I believe about 6,000 years ago, God made everything. 40, 400 years ago, there was a flood. In that flood, lots of critters drowned. And people. We have fossils galore in here of all kinds of things that are buried in rock. That's obviously sedimentary rock laid down by water. So during the flood, you got all kinds of things drowning, including all the people except eight on Noah's Ark. I would be wildly picking a number to say probably a billion people drowned in that flood. That's just a guess, okay? It might have been five. They might have had more people then than we have today. 
they had a lot more of the earth was habitable. They were living a lot longer. I mean, you could have a lot of kids in 800 years. Much bigger families, right? And no reason to not have 100 kids per family because, man, you got the whole world. Property's free. No rent, no utilities. You don't have to get your kids an education so they can make it in life. Just have all you want. Everybody makes it in life, you know. But um, so I tell the kids, you know, next time you go to the gas station, you know, you can think about that flood. Say goodbye, Grandpa. You know, you should have listened to Noah. He told you it's going to rain. Now, when I was in Japan doing my seminar, they said, Mr. Hoven, you have to leave this out of the seminar because the Japanese worship their ancestors. You don't ever say anything bad about ancestors, and they're going to get really offended by that, by that picture right there. Goodbye, Grandpa. You know, they wouldn't ever think, oh, Grandpa's being pumped into my gas tank. Well, technically, it wouldn't be your Grandpa. I know it would be one of Grandpa's uncles, okay? Because uh, <laughs> Grandpa was Noah. But the Bible says Lamech lived 770 years or something after he begat, no, whatever, 580 years, whatever. He lived a long time after he begat Noah, and he begat sons and daughters. Noah had brothers and sisters that drowned in the flood. The own family didn't listen. Maybe you got the same problem, you know, your own family doesn't listen. Most people have somebody in their family that just won't, I got a brother and a sister, just don't want to listen. Yet. We'll get them someday. Um, one more way to prove the earth is young, and we better quit here. In uh, Denver, Colorado, they have, just outside of Denver, what they call the National Ice Core Laboratory. It's in uh, the Federal Center on a military base in uh, the Federal Center in Denver, Colorado. I was preaching there in Denver. I've been there a bunch of times, but I went there once, and one of the guys that was uh, a Christian at this church I was going to go to, he worked at the Federal Center. And he had been talking to two of the scientists who worked in this freezer. That freezer is probably about the size of this building, building five. Okay, it's good size, just the freezer part, which is in the middle of a huge, huge warehouse. He said, Mr. Hoven, when you come, I would like you to go with these guys who work at the, these scientists who work in the freezer at the Federal Center because they go to Greenland and to the South Pole and they drill holes through the ice and they store the ice core in this freezer. And I've been trying to witness to them, and they are convinced the earth is not 6,000 years old. They can prove it's more than that. And I don't know what to say to them. Would you go talk to them? I said, sure. So I saw, went with those guys to the United States Geological Survey, USGS, uh, uh, freezer in, uh, 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 outside of Denver, Colorado, at the Federal Center. And uh, these guys took me in. They gave me this big hat and big coat and big pants and big boots. I mean, it's 36 below zero in this freezer. Okay, I'm from Florida, right? I got thin blood. <laughs> I was freezing. Even with all that stuff on, I was still freezing in just a matter of a minute, you know, just frozen to the core. But we went in this freezer, and these guys said, Now, Mr. Hoven, <clears throat> we go to Greenland, and we drill holes through the ice. And we go to the South Pole and drill holes through the ice. We have a coring machine. There's the coring machine. It's kind of like a tube that as they drill it down, it cuts a hole in the ice, and it, like coring an apple, an apple core, okay? At the end of the tube, there are little teeth. As soon as you start to pull backwards, these teeth come out and catch the ice core and snap it off. So it's like they're drilling around, and whenever they pull backwards, it grips the bottom and snaps off about six feet at a time. They drill down six feet, lift it up, snap off a six-foot section, got to drag the whole thing up out of the hole, take all the pipe apart, every way, all the way up. It takes months and months and months to get an ice core, okay? Because they can only go six feet at a time. So they pull this ice core out and slide it in a styrofoam tube and cap it off and save it in this freezer. They've got to number them. This is ice core number 813, you know, from so many feet down. They drill with this coring machine uh, down into the ice. Lakewood is a suburb. That's it. I couldn't think of it. Uh, this, art this article in the newspaper said, Lakewood, Colorado, Associated Press. Ten ice core samples yanked from a remote Antarctic glacier are resting in a giant freezer here waiting to be tested. Well, these guys took me in the freezer and showed me these ice cores. They pulled one out of the styrofoam tube, laid it on this special table they've got so it doesn't get, you know, contaminated. <laughs> Everything's freezing in there. When you go back to Colorado, see if you can go to Denver and go to the ice core federal center. It's a military base. might be tough to get in, but smile at them. They'll let you in. Um, they showed me these rings on here. Now, what I did for this picture, I put dark black lines with PowerPoint on here because it was so hard to see, okay? But here's, here's one without uh, the dark. They are black lines. 
because they're, it's clear ice. You can see all these probably 200 rings just in this short section here. You figure this ice core is about 5 inches maybe, 4 or 5 inches. And so this is, I'm just picking a number guessing it's probably a 7 foot piece represented here. All right? In 7 feet you got s several hundred layers or maybe a hundred layers, okay? So they got this thing laying on the table and they said, Mr. Oven, do you see the rings on here? Just like tree rings. I said, yep, I see them. They said, now, see this dark ring right here? This is clear because there's no air bubbles in it. And it's clear because this had a chance to melt. In the summer, the surface of Antarctica melts, gets a little thin layer of melted water because the sun shines on it, the rest is frozen. Well, when ice melts, the air bubbles leave. When water freezes, it expands 12% and it traps little air bubbles in there. As the ice snowflakes form, six-sided snowflakes, they trap these little air bubbles in there. But when it melts back to water, it loses that 12% of volume. So when you freeze ice, and when you freeze water, it turns to ice and it floats, which is a good thing, otherwise all the fish would die. Another long story, because ice goes to the top instead of the bottom of the pond. Well, they said, now, Mr. Hoven, in the winter, the snow does not get a chance to melt. It just gets packed tighter and tighter as more snow falls. It gets packed and packed and packed. And, of course, next year you get 10 more feet of snow or whatever. And they said these rings that we're looking at represent annual rings. And they called them annual rings. So did the newspaper here, newspaper article. In Greenland and Antarctica, where the weather is consistently dry and very cold, the glaciers are miles thick, but the annual rings are very thin. The deepest cores can measure over 10,000 feet. Cores from Greenland drilled since 1990 show the northern climate was erratic 135,000 years ago. And they said, Mr. Hoven, you're telling everybody, because we've got this buddy working with us who goes to your seminars and thinks you're right, you're telling everybody the earth is 6,000 years old. We are scientists. Okay. We drill through the ice, and you can lay them out on the table. We can count them for you. There's 135,000 annual rings. How can you tell people the earth is 6,000 years old? Well, guys, you are assuming they are annual rings, aren't you? There were some airplanes in World War II. Brand new airplanes took off for Europe to go fight in, uh, to land in England, and they got caught in a storm and had to turn back. They were supposed to go to England. They got caught near Iceland in a big storm, couldn't get through, had to turn back. They were running out of gas. Five airplanes. So they t called radio back to base, says, guys, we got a problem. Uh, we're not going to make it. We're out of gas. We got a ditch. Got to drop the planes. They flew around, looked for a flat spot. First guy came in, flipped over. The ice was pretty rough. Okay. Told the rest of them, he said, don't put your wheels down. Come in, you know, belly land. Flat, you know, flop this thing on the ice. So the other four, he, he was survived flipping the plane over, but, it, you know, wrecked the plane pretty bad. And they all landed safely. They had to stay there for like, I don't know, two weeks until people could come in with dog sleds and get them. In the middle of no place, Greenland. My daughter and I flew over Greenland coming back from Ireland when I was preaching over there. They got, there was a storm in the Atlantic. We had to fly way up north over Greenland. For an hour, we're looking out the window at all these glaciers. I mean, thousands and thousands of glaciers. Got to be the biggest, you know, <coughs> snow cone I have ever seen. But uh, useless, useless real estate. Anyway, these airplanes landed. In 1990... There was a guy from Kentucky who was, loved World War II airplanes. He got the brilliant idea, hey, there are five brand new airplanes sitting on the ice in Greenland. Nobody ever went and got them. So he went to go get them. Sent a crew up there, spared no expense. They had to find the airplanes using ground-penetrating radar because it snowed since then, okay? In 48 years, it snowed a couple times, a bunch of times. They found the airplanes were 263 feet down, located by the ground penetrating radar. They had moved like three miles from where they landed because of the glacier, ice moving, you know. And they were under 263 feet of ice. And when they drilled, they melted a hole down to get to one of them. Uh, they, they picked a P-38 that based on the pilot's stories, which one's in the best shape when we left it? They said, well, we're going to go after that one because it's going to be the least repair. Well, it didn't work. They had to replace 80% of the parts. Would have been much cheaper to build a totally new airplane from scratch. Okay, they spent like $5 million restoring this airplane, which they could have built for a million probably. You know. <laughs> anyway, they went down, found the airplane, crushed by the weight of the ice. Okay, 
all kinds of, every panel was bent or broken. Uh, they straightened out what they could, but basically had to replace it all. But they took it apart, brought the pieces up. It's a P-38. The, de the Germans called it the Fork Tail Devil. They were scared stiff of that airplane because it was a really good fighter plane. Had machine guns mounted on the top. I don't know if you can see them there uh, on the top of each of those. Uh, the pilot's in the middle. He's got these machine guns gone down each side. Who cares? Well, the guy lives in Middleborough, Kentucky. He had all the pieces brought back there and spent like eight years, hired people, full-time mechanics, like six guys, I don't know, a whole crew, putting this thing together. Spent millions of dollars on restoring this P-38. They call it the Glacier Girl. It is still flying today in air shows. I was in Wisconsin a couple weeks ago. It was there. I was 10 miles away, but I was preaching. Didn't have time to go see it. I've seen it before. Though. I went to Middleborough to meet the guy. Okay, in the ground, 48 years. 263 found, three, three, three feet down. You do the math, that's five and a half feet of year of, of ice every year accumulates on top of these planes. 10,000 foot hole, the deepest they drilled, is 1,800 years worth of ice, not 135,000. The guys told me they could lay the ice core out and prove the Earth is 135,000 years old. Well, that's assuming that they're annual rings. Deeper layers of ice get squished. It's called glacial fern, F-I-R-N. That'd be a good quiz question. Uh, becomes kind of more like a plastic. It kind of flows, you know, a little bit like glaciers kind of they ooze down there. Like a pile of tar will slowly, you know, flatten out. Glaciers do that. Well, for the Christian to say the flood was 4,400 years ago and the ice accumulated since then is absolutely no problem. Bob Carden's one of the guys who dug the airplane out. It'd be wise if you're going to speak on creation to call Bob so you can say, I talked to him. He'll be glad to talk with you. He works there full time at the airport in Middleborough, 606 248 1149, the airport phone number there, little tiny airport. He's one of the guys on the crew that helped dig out the P 38. I went and talked to Bob in April of 99. I saw the airplane. They were still working on it. I think they got it done in 2004 or three. I said, Bob, when you went down to get to the airplane, did you go through ice rings? He said, hundreds of them. I said, now how do you get hundreds of annual rings in 48 years? Shouldn't there be somewhere around like 48? <laughs> he said, annual rings? What are you talking about? I said, well, I was told, you know, you got the dark layer representing summer where it melted and the white layer where it winter and it got packed and you got dark light, dark light, you know, summer, winter, summer, winter. 135,000 years worth. He said, those aren't summer, winter, summer, winter. They represent warm, cold, warm, cold, warm, cold. You can get five of those in one week. It gets warm for a day, cold for two days, get a lot of snow. Nothing to do with uh, annual rings. In 1962, uh, I mean, at 62 feet down, they hit a plywood cover left by another expedition that had gone there before. In 1983, somebody went to try to dig out the plane. They located it and then covered the hole with a piece of plywood so they can go back later, you know, finish digging the hole. We'll have to start over again. Now, the number we gave earlier here was five and a half feet a year. So it can accumulate even faster than that. Now, we know that. Bob told me that there were that 30 to 40 rings accumulated in nine years. So they're not annual rings. That would be something other than annual rings, that's for sure. But here's an article in Scientific American still calling them annual rings. Either the guy's ignorant or he's lying. See, ignorance, you know, can be fixed. Stupid is forever, but ignorance can be fixed. Now, the guy that works with the Eskimos told me, Dr. Hoven, I got 15 layers of snow on my car in eight hours. Not 15 inches, 15 layers of snow. Eskimos have over 40 words for snow. What else is there to talk about? Anybody, like in, you, on the ski slopes, uh, you know, you guys, and Nikki, you know about d d different types of snow. There's all different types of snow, and they've got to watch for that for avalanches. You know, if you get packed snow on top of slippery snow, you've got an avalanche hazard, you know. So anyway, who cares? But uh, the fact is, it is not correct to say that the annual rings would prove the Earth is more than 6,000 years old. Quite the opposite. The ice cores prove the Earth is not more than 4,400 years old since this big flood. <coughs> One of the many, many indicators. We'll cover more of these next week. <laughs>